All right, I cannot wait for this interview. We have one of my close friends. I consider you quite a close friend now because back when I first started this nonprofit, two and a half years ago, Ray was pretty much the first video that we put out, or one of, and we put a five minute video out of his story yeah. of escaping Cuba, joining the US military, serving the country to say thank you to the country wow. that gave him freedom and gave him all this opportunity to now have this beautiful family that you have. And um, it got 25 million views. And it was, it still to this day is our, our top performing video. And now we have finally brought Ray to Dallas for a long form interview to really fully tell his story and it's remarkable. So with that being said, here's Ray Armas. Ray, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. I, I consider myself one of the founders. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Basically that, you're a so, board member. Yeah. Would you like to be on the board? Yes. We'll talk about that later, but I would actually love that. Yeah, I will be you the good guy and the bad guy at the board. I, I do the whole thing. <laughs> good <but>. cop, bad <laughs> cop. <laughs> I love that. I mean, the whole team loves you too. We've been really excited to, to have you down here. Uh, I want to start. Armas, you were saying you have a great story behind your last name. It's kind of sad too. So there's, there were, well, if you really want to go by, by my last name means weapons. Mm -hmm. And I always throw kind of a little bit of pride on that, meaning weapons and army on my uniform. But um, the sad part of the story is back when the depression in Spain, three brothers, one decided to stay in Spain and the other two decided to migrate one to Cuba and the other one uh, somewhere, I think Venezuela, some of the uh, Latin American countries, trying to make fortune, come to find out that the, the two that migrated didn't make any fortune, <laughs> and the one that stayed is the one that actually ended up making a fortune. Today, if you Google the Naviera Armas, my last name, they're one of the biggest ferry between the Canary Islands and Spain and mainland. Like, you're not gonna miss it. It's like, Bad luck chases my family. Yeah. Here I am. I, I thought I was done dealing with communists and socialists. Came to America and little that I knew, we were, now I'm here fighting them again. Yeah. So well, my we were just talking don't... about that and you you were questioning why you have to keep going through this. Can you? Yeah, it's like I'm paying that? some kind of voodoo fee that I don't know, some bad luck thing. The last thing, uh, seriously, the last thing I imagined was that at some point I would have to fight in the U.S. for my kids not to have to go through socialism and communism like, like I did, and God is getting closer, really close. Mm -hmm. So, you, and you have two kids, and so you're worried about yep. them. Wow, so let's go back to your childhood in Cuba. Um, can you explain what, what was happening as Castro came to power? Where, where was your family situated in this, in that time period? Well, like any, any family in Cuba, when you have a kid, and I, I mentioned this before on, on the other video, there's nothing you can do. You have a kid in Cuba on that regime, you know they're gonna indoctrinate him and do their due diligence in brainwashing. And you can say anything, you, can, you, you cannot intervene on that because if you tell something to a seven-year-old or eight-year-old that still doesn't know the consequence of what they said, they go to school, open their mouth, and they say anything they heard at home, and then the entire household will be either unemployed or in prison. Especially in the 80s when I grew up. Right now, they don't care much about it. Right now, it's like here in the US, they don't even put too much of an effort to push a lie. At least back then, you, they would create a whole backstory and make it look like really real. Right now, this society broke down with, with reality. Reality doesn't matter anymore. They will lie in your plain face and, and spoon feed you a lie and they expect it. And the people are actually doing it, so just swallow it. And so, so what you're saying there is, it if the parents were daring to commit wrong think or talking badly about the Castro regime, the worry was that the children would go to school yep. and be so naive and young that they bring up what their parents said, not trying to, to rat them out or anything, but basically then you're exposing your parents for dissenting against the Castro yep. regime, the communists, and you're either sent to jail or... And my, my situation was a little bit more delicate. Uh, I mentioned before, my mom was for the U.S. So, so, so in the U.S. you get you get to understand. My mom was the equivalent equivalent of the state attorney. Wow. And her power was to give people freedom, and, and she got that power on my state. So we, she, not me at that time, which was just a kid, but she she had to be more careful, especially because she was by the Cuban regime standards, she was abusing her her powers. And by that, I mean she was giving people freedom. A anyone that wasn't a rapist of a murder in Cuba, even today, 
If you're not a murderer or a rapist in Cuba and you are in prison, you're in prison for literally surviving or having a big mouth. Bottom line. Because everything, since everything belongs to the state, uh, and the state doesn't provide you with the bare minimum thing of surviving, uh, everything you do is illegal. Like, and so your mom would try and help people get out? Well, what my mom did is, the system there makes it really hard on, on families that have people in prison. They make, especially political related reasons. Like, you literally better off running somebody on with a car than in being in prison for it. You're probably gonna get out of uh, in five years. And if you had a good conduct, you probably get off half of the sentence. But if you do something against the state, meaning any expressing your opinion, or, or I should do some kind of activism, the consequences are even worse. Wow. Like, there is a, a it's like a Nobel Prize, it's called the Sadahoff, the Sadahoff Prize. It's for people that are activists in human rights stuff. This guy in Cuba, Ovaldo Payasa Dina, he was one of the few people that took a step forward and started fighting the government openly. Well, he, four times, a truck almost run over the vehicle that he was. Wow. He survived four times. Guess how he died the fifth time? How? A vehicle run over him. Yeah. So that's what happens to you. Cuba, the regime is really good at getting rid of people, especially since there's a, that whole tradition that people that like, got tired, they just jump on the raft and take off. And you don't have to make it necessarily. So the government knows that. And uh, it's really easy to make Ray disappear. One day I disappear, especially me that I have a history of escaping off raft and things. So one day, if they really want to get rid of me, uh, that was really easy. Just make it disappear, spread the voice that he took a raft or something and sunk in the ocean. And that's how they go about that. That's what they're really good at, making people disappear. So because all that, once my mom, I don't know when, at what point she helped the first person, the underground voice spread out. In, in, let's say, for the lack of other way, in poetic ways, among the oppressed people, the, the word got spread out. I, we started getting people nonstop in my house. Like the underground known state attorney that will help you. Hey, if you need any help, go see. Here's a note from me, I recommend. So my mom would see people left and right. So because, especially for political reason, or, or, uh, or people against the government, they would make it really hard. One thing that they like to do is, for example, if you are from Washington and you decided to fight the government in any means, way or form, you will be sentenced to go to prison in Florida. And if you're from Florida, they will send you in North Carolina. Very opposite to make it really hard on a family because the government there don't uh, don't provide the prison system with enough stuff for for the prison. So the, the government they rely a lot on the family members bringing things to make the prison system run themselves. If your family member needs to wipe his butt, make your mom come here and bring you some toilet paper. That's that's just that's how it is. If not, really? then you don't get it. Yeah, hell yeah, they don't give you anything. They they even put six or seven people in one cell that is designed for three. So then why would they put them in such far distances? To make it hard on your family. Oh, really? Don't you remember what I told you about Che Guevara when he was in charge of executing people? Let's go over that. Okay. When, when, the, when the people that did anything against Fidel Castro and his revolution at the, at the early days, Che Guevara, that one that all these millennials love, he was not the vulture of the Cavania. The Cavania castle is like a very old Spanish fort that they used to carry all the execution. Wait, but the butcher? Yeah, that was his nickname on the wow. streets. Okay. Uh, che Guevara's nickname on the street was the vulture, the Cavania vulture. He was uh, the very last day, right before you were executed. Some of them will be allowed to get the family to say goodbye. Very few, of them. but m later on you're gonna know that it's not. For, it wasn't enough for the goodbye thing. It was more to to intimidate and send the message out there. Well, he would take the family or the person that was about to be executed instead of walking them through the hallways. To the, to the cell where, where the guy was, he would take the family and walk in through the wall where all the execution happened. I mean, you can see bullet holes, pieces of brain and hair and blood on the back of the wall with the flies, because that's in, in the open. And he would make a point that the family walked through there and see that and smell the rotted smell there so they can take that message out of there. And that's how they, the, he, the, 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 the beloved Che Guevara that you see on all these revolutionary T-shirts, 
That's what it, it, gave, it, it really gave me. That, that's what he used to do. One of my biggest disappointments is this guy from Western Night, Rage Against the Machine, awesome guitar player, but every time you see that, it's always with a Che Guevara t-shirt. Can you imagine if Rage Against the Machine had a t-shirt of Hitler on it? Yeah, well, and also Colin Kaepernick uh, wore a shirt with Fidel Castro on it and was yeah. asked about it in Miami, and he didn't even realize who it was. So he committed suicide, a social suicide right there. That's the last place you should do that with Fidel Castro on it. Yeah, yeah. Now, now, what's your message to the people that don't understand the history? Like maybe they've never heard it before, but or maybe they have heard it before and they don't believe it or want to ignore it. Well, you all, you, they, millennials, you owe it to yourself. Grow a brain. And at least the minimum you can do is question everything. Just, just question it. Do me a freaking favor and just question it. Because if they're spoon feeding you all that, I mean, it's wrong. Just, just don't take it. Just don't take it. Question and research behind that. Nothing, no everything that shines is gold. Yeah. And especially something, do you really think the same person in charge of the government for 60 years, do you really think that what he has in mind is a best interest of the people on his head. Yeah, probably. Do you really think somebody in charge of the same thing for 60 years is doing anything good to anybody? At least question that. Yeah. Just, just don't freaking take it. I agree. That's a, that's a great message. I think because it's empowering to them. I, I trust that if they were empowered with the information and they were aware of the situation, they would not be falling for it. And it's unfortunate with the education system, with, with the way we, we just take things for granted. It's all piling on and leading to this ignorance. I told you before, I have a, I recognize, I'll, I'll tell you that, I, I will, I'm willing to recognize that I have a slightly pessimistic view of what's going on here now. But I'm the kind of guy that sees the glass halfway, okay. literally. You can argue that the glass is half full, or you can argue that the glass is halfway empty. But there's one fact is that the glass is in the middle. So even though I might sound pessimistic, it's based on real facts. The fact is that this society broke with reality completely. And we talked about it before. In order to, for two sides to have a conversation, there has to be some common ground, something in common, at least from, from where the conversation can begin with. We don't have that anymore. And I can give you many examples. One of them is the whole uh, sexuality thing that, uh, I mean, I have many gay friends. I, can, I don't have to justify myself or anything. You can feel whatever you want. You can feel a unicorn if you want to feel a unicorn. You can be called a rainbow if you want to be called a rainbow. But another thing is breaking with the reality that we can even have a conversation that a biological male is a male. There's only certain kind of chromosomes. You either XY or, or Y or XX. Whatever, I'm not a biological, but you, you know. And a biological male would never be able to get pregnant. We need to, biology is a fact that you cannot break it. Science of the universe, we cannot break it. But if we cannot agree on that anymore, it opens a can of, of, of worm. Like, the moment the federal government uh, recognized legally that a biological male is a female, even though I don't care, I don't care. My point is that the government shouldn't be putting his hands on it. I mean, we heard of a transracial person recently where they got surgery. Did you see this? A, a British white male got surgery and had his eyes slanted and a few other things done to him and then said he now identifies as Korean. Fine. Transracial. And I have no problem with that because I'm so conservative that my point of view is that the government shouldn't have or anybody should have any say on that. You want to transition? Go ahead. Feel whatever you want to do. Now, and that's it's important for the two sides for us to have a base of reality. Um, I'm curious, let's get back to that, uh, the concept of putting people in prison for disagreeing. And that's, I get worried about that in America today because what what is the common base of reality that we're going to agree on and how are they going to start punishing wrong thinkers and people that go well, against the state? But what I'm curious too is, you told me a story one time about um, getting sent to prison, you could get sent to prison just for daring to go into the ocean if yeah. you're starving and picking up a lobster. Even today, Can you explain that? Even today, you know, 2022, still is illegal for a Cuban to have a lobster. Why? It, it, it's hard to understand and wrap your head around that, that you could go to prison for an eatable item. Uh, why? No, it, it's a big money maker for the government. At this point, I even wonder if it's just tradition now. Let's keep up with the tradition that these cannot even eat a lobster. Mm -hmm. Because it really doesn't make any sense. I mean, 
one person at a time, you don't have the resources. You as a diver by yourself on your own with no scuba gear, because nobody, very, very few people in Cuba have a scuba tank. I'm talking about on your lungs, go feet down there and hold for minutes and see if you can find the lobster. The chances of people doing any damage to the lobster community is very small compared with the government using fleets to catch the lobster. And they, they do that. They, there's not a lack of lobsters, Cuban lobsters on, on Cuban hotels for tourists. It's for the people. That doesn't make any freaking sense that you can spend years in prison for eating one lobster. And on top of that, you might even be the cook working on a hotel as a Cuban that had to prepare that thing and give it to this, maybe a dishwasher from Italy to come and eat the lobster that on your country that you, the people of that country, cannot eat. Yeah. And so... Yeah, up to 12, you can be 6 or 12 years in prison. Wow. Depending on how much you got involved. If you, if, if you get it by yourself, it might be less. If you are known for keeping them and selling them, because that's a big market for it, now you're a dealer, and it goes on from that point. And so what was the food situation like? I mean, if people are willing to go out and risk getting in prison for just grabbing a, a piece of seafood. <laughs> I know I have a friend that he used to go spearfishing on the ground, very illegal. Oh. And he, they would risk their life because they would butcher a uh, sea turtle while they were still in the water. Oh. There's a lot of blood when you butcher a sea turtle. I know here in the U.S. that's a big no-no because the turtles are protected and all that. In Cuba, yeah, they don't want you to grab any of that, but people are starving. I mean, in 1993, did I tell you that I ate a cat, a lot of cats? I, me, myself, I'm proud of that. I, I haven't heard that one. You never heard that? Wait, tell me after you tell the, I need this sea turtle story first, and then I want to hear well, this yeah, cat it's, story. It's, people are willing to risk their life for eating. I mean, if you're up to here, maybe a mile away from, from shoreline, that's kind of deep water in the Caribbean. I guarantee you there's at least one or two sharks around you. The last thing you need is 50 pounds of blood around you because, number one, they're heavy. Number two, you, you don't have a place where to butcher. And number three, if you portion it and slide it right there on the water and you put it on a plastic bag, it's easy to walk out of there because they're, they're far away from the city to do wow. that. So one side, portion of that, nothing goes to waste, but portion of that will be to feed their own family. Portion of that will be to sell and survive or to trade. On the black market. Everything's on the black market. Okay, so then how did you get to eating cats? Let's hear about that. Okay, let me, let me put it this way. Society has told you that a cat is a pet. And you grow like that and pet doesn't cross your mind that it's food. But at the end of the day, there's no difference between the middle one animal to the other. It just is animal. And then I, I really don't see the difference. I, I don't know because I was young when I started and I broke that mental locked that the cat, I don't see a cat. I mean, I can see, I could have a pig as a pet, you know? Yeah. But you can eat it, and, and it happens to you here all the time. What happened is that uh, everything was semi-fine all the way until 1993, which you remember for Cuban history, after in the night, early 90s, the, the Soviet Union collapsed, and the Soviet Union was supplying Cuba with everything, subsidizing everything in Cuba. No one had any need to eat any cat, but then, Things start getting really bad. You know my story with my mom burning the furniture to boil potato. And on 1993, pretty much every building, uh, it looked kind of like the project. No, in a way of violence or crime or anything, just the design of many, many buildings with many, many people living on it. Uh, the Cuban government, at one point, they developed a taste for that, so you can find it everywhere. But for some reason, there was a lot of cats behind those buildings, stray cats. Yeah. And in 1993, the cat population went down in Cuba. And anyone from Cuba that is watching this, they know I'm not exaggerating anything. They went down. People started eating them. It was a source of food on it. And in me being a teenager, when that happened, it became a sport and it became a game. Like we used to go out at night with spear fishing gun that just supposed to be used for underwater. Me and my friends, we used to go out and we hunt cats. Yeah. And let me tell you, this is the thing, my mom, she wouldn't, when she heard rumors about that, she would, for no way in, in earth, she would let me cook them at, at, at home or butchering them then. So I lied to her one time. I, I brought her a piece already cooked. I said, here, mom, grab it. A friend of mine had a rabbit in. So I made her eat it. <laughs> later on, I think three months later, I told her, you remember that uh, rabbit that I brought home? That was cat. Because I wanted her, I, I gave it time to yeah. be out of her system <laughs> so she didn't, Got any 
puking projectile reaction to it. And then, but I need, I wanted her permission to cook it at home. So when I told her, she was like, really? I will spank you to death. But, and then she understood and she, she ended up admitting that, well, it tasted fine. It was good. But she didn't eat it. She, she told me, don't, don't do that to me again. I don't want to eat it. Yeah. I was the one who kept going. Okay. But yeah, it started for necessity. It became a sport. And why not to mix both of them together? Well, and you need the nutrition. I mean. Yeah. It, so, it tastes really good. So let's get back. I know the story about the potatoes and the furniture. Yeah. Can you explain that one for everybody that maybe hasn't heard that one? Well, all the way to 1990, Cuba had a little bit of everything. It wasn't, it wasn't too bad because, again, the Soviet Union was providing everything. But the Soviet Union collapses and everything disappeared pretty much from overnight. And probably because they, I'm guessing the, the higher ups probably started, they, they probably started stockpiling. And it makes sense now because from, in a matter of weeks, the uh, grocery store went from pretty well to nothing. So, 1993 being the bottom, the, the, one of the hardest time, which I, I, I think I shouldn't, I, I can't be saying that anymore because right now as we speak 2022, it, I've been hearing stories that over there right now is even worse really? than 2022. Now and why? May, they, uh, they're struggling right now, I guess all the deals that they used to have. Venezuela used to provide a lot for Cuba, mm. but Venezuela being collapse right now, I, there's not much they can provide. Okay. And I think Cuba is out of friends right now. Uh, again, the Soviet Union collapsed, then he moved to Venezuela, and Venezuela right now is really bad. But uh, it, it, I don't know the details. I don't have many people left there yet. I mean, up to today. And, but one thing I can use for reference is the money exchange. 1993, the Cuban pesos to the dollar was like 140. That gives you an idea. And then, then it got better. Then it got to 20 Cuban pesos for one. Okay. For a lot, for a little bit. That's a big improvement. But you can see a relation between the money value and how bad it is there that right now is around 170 or 160. Wow. So that makes sense. If it's that bad, as they're saying. Yeah. So what, what's this uh, potato story? So in 93, uh, with the big lack of everything, for some reason, the only thing that was coming to the market, uh, government market, uh, through the ration card was potato. Not even salt. There, was, there, there, there wasn't even salt on an island. There wasn't even salt. And uh, but at the same time, there wasn't even power. We were having like 16 hours of blackout every day. There was no propane to cook or, or resource. I mean, people were making cutting trees down and making charcoal. To, to, to be able to cook or just straight wood. And not even that, even that disappeared. So it got bad enough that uh, we, we, I got to see my mom destroying our own furniture in order to make a small fire to boil potato there. And you would think, well, there's rich families and poor family. It kind of makes sense that people with more resources have a better life and people with less resources have a worse life. But this is, <laughs> the thing with socialism is that everybody is brought to the same level. No matter if you have a Harvard degree or you are a street sweeper, everybody lives here at the bottom, at the very same level. There's no, no one, unless your last name is one of the cast. They do, they, they live in a bubble. That's, that's different. Oh, now, what was it like to see your mom have to break apart pieces of the home to do that? I could tell you it was sad and all that, but not at the moment. It's just a survival thing. It's something you have to do, you just go and do it. Yeah. Okay. I now, mean, I what guess the hunger this? is enough. Like if you're that hungry, you don't have any space in your brain to think about the sadness of that. You just, food is one thing. Eat, yeah. Destroy them. Wow. Now, your mom, it, was she a single mom? Was she, did she have? Yeah, she, I, she raised me by herself. What My was that dad like? was out of the picture. I mean, to well, go through that with kids, how many siblings did you have? Uh, half, uh, half brothers and sisters. Yeah, half some, but we didn't grow up together. Okay. But it was just pretty much with my mom and me. Wow, and, that's really uh, sweet. But now that I'm a dad, I didn't give my mom a break. I was really hard on her. <laughs> and I recognized it. I needed it. I mean, she broke a broom in my head a couple of times, and she uh, left the belt on my back a couple of times, and I needed it. 
I, I recognize that spanking is, is necessary sometimes. You cannot have a conversation with a six year or four year old. You cannot explain the difference between life and death or jump, climbing through the balcony on a fourth floor or taking the stairs. They're not gonna understand that. A couple of spankings sometimes saved my life. Now, I, one of my favorite stories that you've told about your childhood before was um, when the USSR fell. And we, you were just explaining yeah. how the, the food supply dropped. Now, that's kind of sad, depression. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, that, that's a story I tell with people all we, the time. I don't know why. Maybe they said it, maybe I didn't pay too much attention about the existence of all the countries in the world. But I'm pretty sure a good part of that reasoning is the obsessive compulsive indoctrination of, of the kids. I swear, I, only, I thought there was only two countries in the world. Beside here, the Soviet Union and the Empire. Which was what? At that time, they didn't refer to the U.S. as the United States of America. They just called the Empire. Oh, yeah, like it's the Empire. The Star Evil Wars. Empire. Yeah, yeah. And um, in 1990, when they knew that the Soviet Union was going to be able to supply anything else to the regime there, they came out with every school. Everybody had to come to the middle. Every school have like a meeting point, like a plaza kind of thing, where the director comes out and they always give every morning a speech. So that day we got the speech of the option zero. That's the key word, option zero, special period. Meaning that just get ready for what's coming down. But they, they got like this obsession that the empire was coming. We need to be ready for war and the empire is coming. The empire here, the empire left, the empire right. So that was that I wasn't that was a boarding school. I spent a week there in school and just go home on a weekend. So and how I, old were you? Oh, I'm on boarding. I, I've been on boarding school since I was in third grade. Okay. And how old were you when in 1990? That was probably ten. Okay. Ten or nine. So all that stayed on my head cooking for one week. So when I get home, and I told my mom we got this speech. I mean, everybody knew what was going on. So when I got home, the, that was the subject: the, the collapsing of the Soviet Union, and we don't know what's going to happen. And I brought the subject to my mom. The empire is coming, and the armies of the empire are gonna be marching through the street here, and I'm gonna fight them today, and I'm gonna throw myself out of a balcony if I have to. <laughs> uh, my mom got freaked out. Because I told you before, if you have a kid under that system, you cannot tell them what's going on because it will ruin the entire family. But I guess that was a red flag big enough that my mom put me to one side and we had the talk. Uh, that I remember that day. It's, that, that's pretty much the only talk I had with my the talk with my mom. I never had to. I never had question about girls or anything like that. Yeah. That was the only talk I remember that my mom and I we had. And, and I was what critical. was this talk? It's not what it looks like. No, everything that shine is gold. She had to be very slow. She, she couldn't feed me the whole lie at once. Yeah. Like we're living under a no, communist yeah, regime. No, no, no. Especially since I told you, you know, she was a state attorney at yeah. the time. She had oh, to keep wow. it very on the low. Because, I mean, if you go back to that subject, she was helping a lot of people. Still playing the role of the state attorney. Mm -hmm. Yes, comrade, the state attorney for one side and on the other side. She freedom, freedom, in this case, freedom, go, go, go. And that put, that put us in, in the blacklist to the point we got a phone intervene and tap and all that. And the society didn't help too much because to survive, everything is on the black market. Yeah. In, at that time in Cuba, we only have the right of 80 grams of bread. It's, it's a bowl of bread this big. 80 grams of, uh, of bread per day per person, that big. That's it. You take your ration card to the bread store, to the bakery, run by the state. When I say bakery, please do not imagine any sweets or cakes yeah. or candy. Just rock solid, look like bricks from the wall, moldy bread. So 80 grams of that. And, but that's the official amount. The unofficial amount is that you go there to take your official amount of bread, you put your ration card there, and only need this extra money. The, the girl on the counter knows what to do. She will give you official amounts because there's people watching when you're doing that. Nobody knows how many people are in your house. In my case, we're only two, so I was supposed to walk out of there with only two bowls of bread, this tiny bit. But they would normally, if you sneak money on it, they would add more bread to that. Okay. But they knew who I was. They knew who my mom was. They wouldn't sell anything for fear. A lot of people didn't know where she's standing at. All they know is that she's a state uh, official. So I didn't get it easy at all. Uh, I had to suck it. Yeah. Now, but looking back as an adult now 
and you see the importance of what your mom was doing, do you have a new perspective on on just how admirable that was? Yes, but I can see the benefit of me as a child going through that. Yeah. It is a really rough way to learn, but man, it's a guaranteed way to learn. And I'm scared for my kids because it's an easy life here. So far, it is an easy life. Even though we're not rich or anything, we, we blue collar, I work like an animal, and I maybe make it with $100 at the end of the month after, after the bills and all that. But there's always somebody worse than you. Yeah. I, I, live, I live a life of a king. I have a freaking car. I don't have to take the <laughs> public transportation. I have a car, and I open the refrigerator, and I got something to eat, and I have a roof, and the house, guess what? has the AC. Tell me that. If you look, just look back and see... That's the thing I told you, when life gets too easy, we ended up with what what we have today. A bunch of ungrateful that don't appreciate what they have. Because these people, humans, have the condition that in order to know what they have, they need to lose it. And that's my fear with my kids. I don't know, even if if I'm lucky enough that they have an open brain and we can have a nice conversation, they're never gonna know what it is. To really don't have nothing, especially your freedom. And it's, it's a big cliche here. I mean, how many generations of Americans have been born under slavery? N- none of them. If you don't think that communism is a way of slavery, you, you, you're a dumb idiot. Yeah. There's many ways of slavery, not just the one that they uh, uh, break the whip on your back. Although I got, uh, I got beaten by the police too. So if you want to add that to the list of different ways of slavery, yeah. yeah. But on, on the sense of entitlement, and ungrateful, being ungrateful is one of my two bigger fears with my kids. Wow. And I don't, I don't, I really don't see, I hope I'm lucky enough that they, they understand, but I really don't see any other way to really, really show them what they have here. As American born kids, I guess I'm gonna somehow sneak them into Cuba. Yeah. Well, I that, will. That's the hard thing is, it's so good here that it's biting us in the butt because now our kids cannot even compute in their heads that things could be bad, like very bad. Like you could be forced to do something. You could starve. You could uh, go through massive oppression. They see a a tiny situation in America and they go, this is horrifying. We must try socialism. Very few people have the intellectual power to see that without the need of going through the... Yeah. But hopefully, I mean, the, the best thing we could do in that sense right now, because we can't get everybody to Cuba, is to, to try and get as many stories and details. Because mm. it's the details that I think really help I don't people. know. I still don't know, Morgan. I, I, I don't, I don't I see understand. any I understand. I think it's it's the lot that's going to be needed. I told you early, stories help. one way that will guarantee the fix of all this is really lose everything. Well, we know all the freedoms that we have today has a society. And has a society go through the struggle of sucking it. Then I guarantee it's, it's a hard way to learn, but I guarantee you the generations coming after that, that they're going to appreciate it. Okay. And it goes back to this captain. I remember his name. I never remember his name, but it was, it's a captain of the Marines, retired. He wrote a book, and he mentioned, and that was a mind explosion when I heard that. Because it's perfect. He boiled it to one thing. Hard times make good men. Good men make good times. Good times create weak men, mm-hmm. and weak men create hard times. And it's a cycle. Yeah. And if we go back, I mean, go back to those cycles, you will see the greatest generation, the baby boomers, guess who they were? They were the kids that really, really struggled under the Depression in the 1930s. They grew up, they get the greatest generation ever, they went, the, the, the young guys that went to the Second World War, which I'm impressed with that flag, that was in D-Day. It was. You really, the hardest time America has seen, the depression created the greatest generation that America has seen so far, that generation. And then life got so, so freaking good for, so, for more than one generation. And now this is what we, we're suffering. Those kids that grew up on a really easy life, now they hold positions on the government and they're creating these hard times now. Yeah. So hopefully out of this, that's why we had to, uh, the way I see it, we're gonna have to follow the cycle. We have to really go through really hard times so we can come out of the ashes. Yeah, no, I, I believe that that's what's happening. Um, I agree with you. Uh, let's get back to, to where your mom's story was left off just now. What ended up happening 
in her career? And, and can you talk about, I mean, did she get exposed? Did things yeah. get worse? Well, when they find out what she was doing, they couldn't attack her straight directly because she was doing it properly. Like, <clears throat> when you were due for review on your case and you were due for early parole, their tendency there, if you're the enemy of the state, they would deny it. And they would stretch and stretch and make it harder on you. So technically she wasn't breaking the law because she was giving them away when on paper were supposed to happen if you complete all the shirt marks. So the way to make it harder on her to do that, they started taking resources out of her. The prisons are really far away from the cities. So they took away the vehicle, the government vehicle that's supposed to take her on those places to do the, the job. Especially because they didn't like too much the idea that she was using that vehicle to carry care bags. Okay. Remember I told you that they make it really hard on a family to bring the bare basic necessity items for the prison? Yeah. She was taking them herself. Because she had In her access government to the car. <laughs> on the government car. Yeah. So they took the car away. Okay. But thinking that she was going to quit, they just made it hard on her. So now you got a fi over a 50-year-old woman with osteoporosis, because that's, that's what happens to women when they go to uh, menopause and your diet is really poor, especially on calcium. When you go to menopause and your diet is pretty poor, your body steals calcium of your bones in order to survive. Pretty much turns your bones into honeycombs, yeah. big holes everywhere. So very fragile, you could break Wow. Anything in your body. And all she's eating is that bread. Crap. We, I don't even know how she made it. And uh, now you got that over 50 years old woman carrying still the same amount of care packs, hijacking on the highway to go to prison and do her job and carrying all that from the people. Wow. And she kept, she was, she was more, I get, I get the stop, my stubbornness might be from her. So she <laughs> kept pushing it. Probably. On top of that, before Castro, my family was Catholic, so she was baptized. Castro showed up, religion got prohibited in Cuba, pretty much. And they got softened around 1998. Remember that John Paul II was coming to Cuba, and then Castro realized a week before he showed up, he said, hey, Christmas is legal again. We could have Christmas now. Yeah. Yeah, because Christmas disappeared in Cuba. And so she, at that time, she started going to church again. And they really hated that, too. So it wasn't openly prohibited, but it still looked bad for a government official to go to church. And if you add all that up, yeah, they, they were really pissed off at her. And, and at the same time, I, I, I developed a big mouth. At this time, I'm 13, 14. Mm -hmm. So I, we got a talk when I was 10. So 13, 14, I was blowing like a piece of dynamite. Okay. I was calling the police, the regime, dictatorship. So I was calling, you name it. I was getting what? beat up. Was your mom asking you to stop? Yeah, but I wouldn't. And then I would get detained. That somebody on the police station would recognize I was the son of a state attorney. And say, hey, let's call her. This guy's here again. And that, meanwhile, I'm I'm jailing on the on the cell right there, calling them every name you can imagine, and calling this is a, this is a, a police state. There's no liberty here. This were you worried? I mean, Ray. Yeah, I got I got a couple of beatings sometimes, but I knew I. I I admitted, I knew that my mom having that position was gonna make them him, on them really hard okay. to create a so case. So you felt like you weren't gonna go get But at, at one point, attacked. I had a Q and KGB officer telling me and my mom, in front of my mom's face, because she was being very annoying, what are you having here? I mean, I'm, I'm sitting with handcuffs in front of him. I'm, I'm detained, I don't know this time what was the reason for. But I'm detained, my mom is there arguing, why do you have a detain? And this guy got enough, fed up with my mom, turned to my mom and told her, Sarah attorney, whatever the name is, Fikad. Fikad is, is the Sarah attorney. Cut it off. If we want it, we will put cocaine on his shirt right now and we have a case, whatever case he wants. So he pretty much told him, cut the crap off. Stop annoying me. If, if, I, if I want him right now in prison, I just put cocaine on. So he was telling her that this is a routine intimidation kind of thing. Yeah. Could be anything. Could be me walking out of my house without a shirt. It is illegal to be without a shirt in Cuba. You have to be on the beach area. It is illegal to walk on the grass. Why? I don't know. It's Alice in Wonderland. Nothing, nothing makes sense. Why would a lobster get you to prison? What about um, long hair? Yeah. Is that, why That's was the time. that? Well, me on a 13, on a teenage year. 
I got my first tattoo when I was 14. My mom almost killed me, but I, I, I went in and did it. Stubborn. I'm stubborn. Yeah. So long hair, ear piercing, rock music, the music of the empire. So, the West, uh, the music of oh, the West, oh, right? Oh, yeah. You they didn't to let you listen to rock and roll? Hell no. No, no, no. You listen to rock music in Cuba in the 80s, it was a well-known fact that you would get a beating in your way home. That the police would be staged somewhere around the block just to catch the people that went to listen to rock music. Wow. So long hair, rock music. Yep. Didn't you say the Beatles, too? That was a no-no? That was on my mom's day in the 60s. When okay. the Beatles, yeah, it was prohibited. Later on, Castro made a statue of John Lennon in Havana, whenever it was convenient. Mm. Like Christmas was prohibited until whatever it was convenient for him to legalize it again. Interesting. And, and so was that just to prevent Western influence yeah, in the course. country? Yeah, and... Yeah, that's why communists always break. One of, the, one of the signs of totalitarian regimes is breaking with religion. Break complete religion, relationship with religion. You can follow that as a pattern. China did it. Uh, Romania did it. The Soviet Union did it. Break with religion. <laughs> you cannot have another set of rules. It's better moral rules. Yeah, or something you that you can. fight for, look up to, nope. see higher as big daddy government. Nope. Wow. Okay, so that's really interesting. And you got beaten by the police for being a rebellious teen, yeah. having long hair, listening to rock and roll. Um, where does that put you then? So, so your mom is more getting rebellious. more and more in trouble. Yeah. You're getting more and more in trouble. So we were really deep into, she was getting older. And I was getting older too, bigger mouth. At that time, I already have several attempts to escape. Really? To, oh, yeah. I, I escaped. How are you trying to escape? Oof. One of them was, I'm glad it didn't work out. One of the time I was escaping 90 miles to just on a freaking canoe. I'm pretty sure that wasn't going to make it in not even three or four miles. That was going to sink. The other one that fell was a two raft, two inner tubes of a tractor, like a farm tractor. We take the inner tubes out of there. You inflate it outside of the tire, they get overinflated. They get this big. So we had that, and it started leaking at some point. We had to swim back. Is that all the times you failed that you yeah, had to all swim the failed back? Time. One time we, uh, stealing is a hard word for the U.S. to me to say that I stole something. Uh -huh. But when everything belongs to the government, yeah. I told you, in Cuba, there's two kind of thief. Well, not really, there's only one. Thief is the one who steals from people and you break into somebody's house and steal. Uh -huh. If you take from the government, nah, that's a career. That's <laughs> be good. <laughs> so I acquired from the government, me and a couple of friends. Acquired. Yeah, I, I borrowed uh, for an undetermined time. A beach catamaran, a holy cat. Mm -hmm. But when you take that thing and you hide in the middle of the jungle to assemble that, but that's, if you get caught with a holy cat on your hands, you as a person in Cuba, I think it's better if you get caught with 50 kilos of cocaine. It's you better off that if you get caught with some kind of device that will take you, you will float away and you can escape. Especially since that belongs to Now, the why are they so against people leaving? Do you know? What kind of kingdom is without peasants? Yeah. They don't like to work. Somebody has to do their work. Oh, God. You lose the fun if you don't have slaves. Yeah. Then they, the mentality evolved a little bit. They, they're still hard to leave, but they figure it out. Guess what's it today? Guess what's the number one economy in Cuba? That the number one industry. Um, Cubans um, outside Cuba sending money to the family. That generates more money than tourism. Really? More than it's tourism. It's emotional blackmail. They know what. Even if that's common, do, do you think you as a dad, you're gonna leave your son there starving? You're gonna send money. You will send money to your 80 year old mom. Yeah. They take advantage of that emotional blackmail, and it's not weird to notice that they. A younger person will get a good chance to leave and be approved to leave, but your 80 year old mom won. So the, you create division on the family, that guarantee you send the money. If I let the entire family go, it's, yeah. you lose that income. Well, actually, speaking of that, um, we recently interviewed Louis from Cuba as well, and he was explaining the process would be even if you get your papers and you're allowed to leave, they come on the plane right as you're about to take yeah. off and they pick a couple of the family members in the unit that have to stay behind. They can. And there's multiple reasons for it, apparently, because the guy that we interviewed had connections to former Cuban officials. And they said one was to destroy the nuclear family so that you have broken up families, basically individuals mm -hmm. just forced there to stay and work and, and be the slaves. 
stuck there. Uh, and then the other was to make sure that when the family members that left did leave, they would not be bad mouthing the mm. regime because they'd be scared for their family members. You got but, consequences. but that third aspect of sending money back and, and taking care of your family in that way is interesting. It's a lot. I yeah. mean, it is the number one industry in Cuba. That's what keeps the Cuba afloat the most. Wow. I mean, the people, I mean, the, the, the elite, they have their own drug dealing deals mm -hmm. in bank, shadow bank accounts. That they, so they wait, so account. what was going on in your head? Were you just being an immature teen when you were thinking that you were going to escape with your mom still there? I had to do something. I, yeah. I, couldn't, I couldn't leave with myself sitting there and just let the years pass by. And uh, I would probably kill myself. It's, it's when you realize, but at, at that time, I knew what the U.S. was. Mm -hmm. And I literally idealized the U.S. history when it comes from the first country that ever stood up to the king and set themselves free. I take really? that really, oh, I take that really personal. I mean, look at me. I, I, look at where I'm standing. I and mean, right 90 miles away, I got a country that did, stood up to the freaking king. So you know what? That's it. We're free now. We're our own country. Do you know how you, how'd you hear about the American Revolution? Uh, sneaks thing, not much. There's some movies here, movie there, and you ended up putting all together and you get a picture of everything. Really? But the history that they tell you there is not complete. No. Now, what about like the I Bill of Rights, knew. Declaration of Independence? Like, did you hear like in America they have these things called unalienable rights given to you by God? A little bit, but the big, su a big surprise for me was to find out that the 1940s Cuban Constitution uh -huh. was the the template for it was the U.S. Constitution. Huh. And if you dig through that that way, you're gonna find out there's a lot of countries that had to take the U.S. Constitution as oh, a, as a template. There's a ton. A and ton. it's almost perfect. If you take if I tell you, draw me this at one time, and you only allow th no more than three defects on it, then nail it. Yeah. Wow. So as a, a teenager, you knew the concept of America just 90 miles away from you, oh, and yeah. you aspired to that. And even more, we, when I was a teenager, I knew one way or another. In the back of my head, I had to do something to be in you know, on, on the armed forces in the United States. I had to be part of that. Really? I had to be part of that. I had to be part of kicking asses or something. <laughs> It's, it's all about, it's, it's part of the American way to be. Wow. So we a teenager in Cuba ass. saying, I'm going to get to America and join the military. Yeah. Wow. Be, that could be a commercial for us. Look, hate it or love it, I don't freaking care. Somebody has to be the strong one in the world. Because somebody always will. Mm -hmm. And you, you better be the one, the U.S., than someone in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. be, believe me, you create a void here in, in a strength and power, somebody's going to take that. Wow. Somebody's going to cover that void. So, hell yeah, the yeah. U.S. Well, you made it happen. And I don't want to skip ahead. So let's get to what you did next. You tried to leave a couple times. It yeah. didn't work. You ended up swimming back. Can you talk about, I mean, I know you, you end up losing your mom. Yeah. And that leads to you making well, that final decision to go. Do you remember how I told you how easy the sneaky KGB, which is the Q and KGB is called G2. Okay. They're really good at getting rid of people one way or another. The whole, I guess at some point they realized that just beating people in the middle of the street, it doesn't work too much. So they took advantage of my mom going through all those health issues. At one point she got a brain aneurysm and we went to the hospital and every hospital there has a policeman on the door to analyze any, any case that comes by. Uh, they, they, they need to know if whatever injury is coming here, injury is coming here, is politics related or what it is. Oh. So they always have an officer there on the door. And she was well known on, on, on the city to the point that on her funeral, I told you before, on her funeral, the block, the, the, the city block in front of the funeral home was blocked, just packed with people, people that I don't even knew. Really? My aunts and my neighbors, they told me, yeah, this, this guy, his mom was... Uh, his son is in prison and she was there and people that she helped all the time. And it, it was pretty impressive. That's amazing. So when she got to the hospital, when you have an aneurysm rupture in your brain, you only have like 48 hours to survive if you get surgery in time. What's the best way to get rid of her? Just let it rot there on that neurological waiting room. The one I told you there was one bed pen for 76 people. I wish I had a camera by then. I could take a picture of the inside of that pen. That, I've seen pictures of Auschwitz and the way the, the Jews were concentrated on those bunk beds and really poor condition and really skinny people. Like that. It was pretty much like that. Uh, people weren't concentrated on that room, but 
the, the health condition of the people there, really, really bad. I mean, not too long ago, somebody sneaked out pictures of a psychiatric, main psychiatric institution in, in Havana. It was literally Auschwitz. Dead bodies just piling over there because they, they, they're really famous in Cuba of mistreating mental illness patients, like really bad. Oh, wow. Like, I'm sure if I look online, I can I can show you a picture. I will show it to yeah. you. Right? Creepy, creepy picture. Wow. And that's so, I mean, that's, that's so great. You hear that that connection in communist regimes when the government controls health care. It's oh, one of the biggest ways to weaponize power. I mean, they can deny health care from anybody they want yeah. to. Through friends of friends of friends, that old favor to my mom, we ended up getting her at the very end. It didn't did anything good because she ended up passing anyway. It was too late. But I managed, or I should say we, the group of people that was helping my mom, I managed to get her on the Almehedas Hospital. This is the hospital, and I saw him, Michael Moore. Oh, yeah. The same Tell us day about he that. was there shooting on the Almehedas. The Almehedas is the hospital that I saw. If you don't have their connection, you don't get there. I mean, you can't blame me. My mom knew people, they owe her favor, yeah. and she was really good. She deserved the favors that we call out to get her there. Yeah. I caught Michael Moore there. I chased him, him and his team. I want to say hi. I didn't know much. I knew who Michael Moore was, but know where he leaned. At the time, I'm in Cuba. I didn't know much about left and right here in the U.S. I just yeah. knew that he was Michael Moore. Years later, I'm here, and I realized what he was doing there. He was shooting a documentary where he's comparing the Cuban healthcare with the American healthcare system. Yeah. But where he makes the Cuban healthcare system looks really good. What he doesn't tell you in the documentary is that he shot on that hospital. That's the elite hospital. That's the hospital that has everything they need. That's the hospital that take any international figure that they want to show the face. Just like no Korea fake street vending full of fruits and food. Yeah. That's that hospital. Wow. It's the same and thing. And you were there that day. And I was there that day. And I chased him. And somebody, he got into the van. Because this is the other thing he doesn't tell you. He was walking pretty weird. He was getting free care and attention from Fidel Castro's top of the line doctors for his knee problem. I want Michael Moore to come out and say that I'm lying to what I'm saying. He was getting free health care in Cuba from the elite for his and knees on. And I find out that. <laughs> so one hand, watch the other, and both watch the face. Uh -huh. That's what he was doing, getting freebies over there. That's why he loved that. But he doesn't tell you that the, the people don't get that service. Because I saw a black guy on the, on the lobby of that hotel coming in with a pain on the stomach. Something was wrong on his belly. And he was demanding to be, at, to be seen on that hospital because Cubans are not stupid. We all know that that hospital has everything you need, the top of the line to survive. Not the hospital next door where the regular people get sent on to die on the purgatory. He wanted attention there. Guess what was the attention he got? What? Two police cruisers and an extra beating on in the stomach. I think he probably died. I don't think some, and they're talking away. I, I don't know what happened to him. Wow. Because that hospital is not for the people. There's not a walking uh, uh, lobby here that you just walk and talk to the doctor. You need referrals over referrals and someone for someone. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Uh, so then your mom didn't make it? No. After 48 hours, blood, if blood is in your brain in places that are not supposed to be, it's a very bad irritant. It actually destroys the brain and when it's there. It, there was nothing to do. So that's a good way to get rid of her. And then things got bad for me. I'm sorry. So I lost, I, I don't, I'm sorry the way she went out, but I, the way I see it is she got out of there. Yeah. Done, she got out. That's the way I see it. And, and I got out of there and at least they cannot emotionally blackmail me now. Can you, can you imagine, sometimes I think, what would it be if my mom would still be there and I'm here? They would, I don't know what they would do with me. Yeah. I guess, because they, she had one of those positions that they could deny her to leave. Like doctors, if you graduate in cure of medicine, you got a degree on, on, on medicine, you would never leave. They would never leave you. They would never allow you to leave the island. Mm -hmm. Doctors and police. And so now that you don't have that connection anymore with family, you make a more serious plan to leave, right? Mm -hmm. It got really bad. They, they didn't help. The, the phone tabbing thing got even worse that they would breathe there on the phone so I knew they were listening. 
kind of weird mail. I got I started to get mail with some weird stories. Like on the text of the mail, it said they, they, they would say something like, "Do you remember when we did cocaine together?" Said, Who the hell are you? When do we even did uh, cocaine or nothing? He ended up looking like some kind of like planting evidence. Okay. So I was expecting at some point some kind of like surprise, uh, article swapping of a room or they break into the house to, aha, look what we got here, something like that. So he got really bad. And but but before that, I already did the the windsurfing escape. Okay. So I had some paperwork or halfway done with the U.S. Embassy. Like I was going through the whole uh, process of le uh, leaving as a political refugee. So all this of her dying and all these letters and crap that are KGB crap that they were creating, it helped to uh, kind of uh, speed up a little bit the process. Because every time something like that happened, I just grabbed it and went to Havana and deposited the system is so corrupt, they don't even trust in the mail. I didn't even have to put it on the mail. They have a mailbox right there. I would have to put my hand through the U.S. Embassy, and there's a, a drop box yeah. over there. It's because you, you don't trust it. That was the only way to guarantee that the U.S. would get a sample of that. And until I got the final, uh, the final call, like you got to approve. I went to three interviews. For refugee status? Yeah. The last one was with an actual American officer. And one giveaway, because all those offices are packed with Cuban spies. So the Cuban government infiltrate on the U.S. Embassy all the employees that they need to run, except the very last officer that interview is the Cuban KGB. Really? It's, yeah. You either take that deal or there's no talking or no, no dealing in the office. So, and a giveaway of that is that my last interview, where I sit down from with a U.S. person, is like a bank vault. When she said, okay, I'm not going to do it, she said, come in, and I grabbed the door, the door was like, 700 pounds, and the door is full of pins, security pins, it's like a vault. So when I walk in there, I close that door, the whole thing went like, like a bank vault, and the glass was this thick. And that's when I, that was the, la the, the first time I had to get a conversation with somebody from the U.S. How did you Bolivia. trust him? I mean, how did you know? Well, I mean, I have everything to gain and nothing to lose. What else are you going to Yeah. So I did mean, you just open up and say everything? Oh, yeah. and, and this is how I knew it was going in the right direction. <laughs> when the whole subject of windsurfing came out, she grabbed the keyboard, pushed it to the side, and did it. You did what? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, in actually, my mind, I was like, yes, she's into the story. So we forgot to go over that. Let, can we talk about the windsurfing experience? All right, from where? Where do you want me to start? I mean, how does someone Well, I told you I have many this? attempts of many other But things. the one that gets you stuck all the way over right off the shore of America. Yeah, the, uh, I had a friend, part of my family is from this main touristic town, full of hotels, nice tropical beaches. When you say Caribbean and beer, cold beer in your hand, and whatever comes to your mind, that's with that half of my family. So one neighbor, a friend of mine, had somehow one board, one sail, one, one set of windsurfing equipment. That was my first encounter with it. And I tried a couple of times, and I never got to, to do it a lot or have my own one. But years came by, my escapes came by, and I managed to get my hands on uh, used windsurfing equipment, really old. Like, if we were in the 90s, you, Cuba would have like 1980s equipment. If we were in the 2000s in Cuba, we would get 1990s equipment. And isn't that because it like wrote, uh, comes up on the yeah. shore? And you just have to. That's get the why they can prohibit it. That's why every time somebody escapes from Cuba, they can come down really hard, and there's no more windsurfing in the island. Because go ahead, prove me where you got that from. That's not a windsurfing store. Who gave you that? Where you got that? Oh, I bought it from such and such. And they can trace that all the way up to the hotel that it was stolen. Yeah. Or given away by the tourists. Okay. But very few tourists fly with a massive windsurfing board and a mass in the sail, mm -hmm. so they know 90 percent of the time is taken. So were you just doing it for hobby at first, yeah. I mean, to pass the time, and then when did you decide well, to try it out? I have another good friend that he's in Florida right now too, actually, and he he did it in 1992. He took a windsurfing board and escaped and made it, and that was always on the back of my hand. But that was cooking over there on the back, but I never really thought about it. I guess one, and I, I, I was doing it as a hobby, but I guess one day I was really fed up. One of those points that you choose that you either, I, I don't care if I die. Then, what are the outcomes of this? Either I make it and a big smile on my face, or I drown in the middle of the ocean, still with a big mouse on my, a smile on my face. 
And it's all about how much do you really value your freedom? Do you really want to die here at this, this life? I should go, try. If I die, at least I'm away from him. I'm away from Castro. It, how messed up is that? That you're in the middle of the ocean and at least you look back and you, that's the first time you know you're free. And a couple of times I've went down. Well, let me tell you a story of how that happened. Yeah. One day, uh, we spent the entire day windsurfing, like close to eight hours on it. And one day I calculated how many miles the bay have because I have to go back and forward, back and forward. And we calculated roughly that if you do all that back and forward during eight hours in one straight line, you almost makes it to the U.S. Yeah. <laughs> and we started joking, laughing about it, all that. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so not too long after that, we finished windsurfing. I told a friend of mine, I need you, because I had a, a rig behind my bicycle that I put all the equipment there and we would pedal back to my house. And on the way to my house, I told him, I need you to stay. Can you stay in my house with me? I need you to give me a hand tomorrow morning. So sleep in my house, and I need your hand tomorrow morning. I didn't put too much thought. I didn't because if you if you put too much thought about that and you try to plan it, the logical human solution when you add two plus two equals four, four meaning don't do that. Yeah, you so don't want to do that. That's why you don't make the numbers. You just <laughs> just stay in my house. So in the morning I went. We pedal early in the morning, still dark. Yeah, because you don't want to be seen with that kind of things past this point of the bay. Yeah. Because you have no, re you really don't have any business being in the water past that point of the bay. Because you obviously, obviously after some nefarious uh, intention. Mm -hmm. And when he saw me there, when we get to the beach, I told him, we started rigging me my equipment, and I told him, I'm leaving. And he was like, <laughs> yeah, sure, you what? Yeah, I'm leaving. I need you, but the reason I want you here so you can tell all my equipment, it's very valuable, the bicycle, and and the, a bicycle is a mean of transportation in Cuba. Yeah. It's highly valuable. And I so said, I need you to take all that back to my house. I'm just gonna take off. And he, he later on, he told me, I stay there all the way until you disappear in the ocean, under the horizon. Up to that point, I thought you were joking, and at one point, you're gonna turn around and laugh on my face, like, ha I got you. You know, you, you disappear in the horizon. So I did that. I, I, I told you at this point, nobody has any business being around there because a fisherman in Cuba, if you have a fishing boat, number one, you have to be in a good list, not on a list, on a good list of the government. So they authorize you to have a fishing boat. Nonetheless, that boat slips deep into the river where there's a checkpoint. So to go from the river into the bay, to go fishing, you have to go through that checkpoint and they determine how much fuel you have. Just enough fuel to go to a fishing point and back. Mm -hmm. Because why are you going with 350,000 gallons of fuel? You, you're not going fishing, you know, the whole point of control. Yeah. So I'm way out of the normal area of the bay, heading out, and I can see two fishing boats, like kind of weird head, heading to where I am. I don't know exactly what for, there's no need to go there to fish. The only thing I can think is, if they actually got to, to cut me and turn me into the authority, that would make them look really good. That would put him on some, those two guys, in some kind of special yeah. list. If they like, catch a bad good guy. Good job, what you did. Yeah. Anyway, the wind took off and I went like a fart <laughs> out of there. So there's, a, there's no nautical charts. Uh, the only rumors that I knew kind of calculate what I was doing is the rumors were there's a mountain in the city uh -huh. that in relation based on the height that it has and how far you need to go until you disappear on the horizon the rumor says that when that happens with the mountain when you look back it's gone the rumor says you're 30 miles away and Cuba national water is really not that much it's only 12 miles okay from 12 miles on is like international water and nobody's water and then the U.S. so that happened in one hour so I calculate, is that, is that, if I did 30 miles in one hour, Whoa. This, this thing is only going to take me like eight or nine hours at the most. Yeah. Hours, because wind drops and you slow down or picked up. And I got one thing, curious, call it whatever you want to call it. My mom, she, she wanted to think that was guardian angels. I happen to think they were annoying fishes. Like with me all the way from Cuba to the U.S., I got a, a bunch of flying fish next to me. They actually fly. At that point, I never seen it. I seen it in documentaries, but I never seen it. I thought they used to jump and get back on the water. No, these actually fly. 
They got out of the water, they flapped the wings, and they actually get to do turns. And that's what got me worried, because if one of these decides to take to the right to me, he's going to poke a hole in my sail this big, yeah. and I'm going to be beating fish in the head with whatever I got in my hand. Uh -huh. But somehow, I, I used to laugh, and, and I remember I used to laugh and look at them doing that. How boring your life is that you have nothing better to do than to follow me from Cuba to Miami, to Florida. That, that's, man, I wish I could do that just for fun, go to Miami. Hey, let's go to Miami. Let's follow this, this dumb man. Mm -hmm. So after probably four hours of doing that, on the horizon, I see something wide. At first, I thought it was a lighthouse. I was really excited. I thought it was uh -huh. uh, land, at least, because I was running out of water. Okay. I only have a small backpack on, on, on my bag. I had like a liter of, of water, of fresh water. And by that time, I only have like two fingers left. And I, I saw that thing that I thought it was a lighthouse, and I started getting closer. And as I started getting closer, I started seeing a red stripe on it. And you, holy crap, that's the U.S. Coast Guard. And we start getting closer and closer and closer until we actually, I actually sailed by them, maybe two miles away from each other. And all the time I was telling to myself, this is it, that's it. This is where they're going to cut me, and this is the end of the, of the story. But literally, I knew I kept going. They kept going. We cross each other path. We go, what the hell did just happen? Yeah. So from that point, I kept going an hour and a half more. And at this point, a half or an hour and a half later, the entire ocean was covered on seaweed. This, any little bit of things that you get on the fin, you got the board and underneath you got like a, a fin that what helps you to keep track of where you're going. Anything, I mean anything that gets caught in there, it feels like seven people are holding your board down. You go from 90 miles per hour to one, but something get in there and the, all the seaweed, I was getting it collected in there and I had to get down, take it off. It was really exhausting. I was getting really tired and there was all the way to where I can see in the horizon was seaweed. So there was no point to keep going. So I told myself, let me try back one hour and a half, which is the same amount of time that passed from the moment I saw them. Let me try back again. If after an hour and a half, I don't see the Coast Guard, I will make a decision then. I don't know, probably sit on the board. Back to Cuba is not an option, it's way too many miles. And I wasn't gonna make it anyway. So one of the options was probably just put my head under the water and take a couple of deep breath and just go down smiling. And I told you, it, it's really, it might, it might sound like a cliche, but this is the first time in my life I'm really, really free. Like literally free, away from the grasp of these in queue. And I wouldn't mind it. I swear I wouldn't mind it going down. But I went back an hour and a half. I did saw the Coast Guard and I, I, now, nowadays that I'm here, I, I, first it was depressing to deal with it. Like when I got back to Cuba, it was kind of depressing to know that I was probably the only Cuban that ever chased the Coast Guard. And they never, they didn't saw me. It took a while for me chasing them. And so you chased down the U.S. Coast Guard. I got the embarrassment title of being the only Cuban that chased the Coast Guard, and they took a while for them to see me. When they saw me, they lowered one of their rescue inflatable boats, and they came to me, and they started talking to me. And I knew English at the time, and they started talking to me in English. And I told them, I remember they were, they wanted to know what was going on, if I was fine. I was just eyeballing the bottle of water they had. They said, can I have water? And I, I told them in Spanish. But I didn't want to play dumb. Like I'm come to find out, they thought they saw me when when we crossed paths for the first time. They saw me. They just I wasn't that far from from the Florida Keys, so they thought, okay, this guy's kind of far, but it's normal. I didn't wow. knew that. I knew where I was going, but I didn't know how close I was. How close were you? They I'm not supposed to know that. They're not supposed to tell me, but somebody there told me. I don't want to say because I still want to come in contact with that crew or that boat. April 2004, and the boat was the USCG Confidence. And there's pictures of me and video of me. The captain even came to shake the hand with me. And they saved my equipment and all that. But they told me I was around 18 miles from Marathon Key. 18 miles. How come they had to take you back? Can you explain the policy the, at the, the time? The policy changed depending on the year and who's in the White House and what relationship they had going on. Uh, for the longest time, they have the dry, wet philosophy that if you are, if you make it to land, you get to stay. If you get on, if they cut you on water, they send you back. That kind of thing. So I, I spent three days sailing with them on the on the coast guard, and 
the first day they approach land and an immigration officer comes on board and gives everybody they have their an interview. Later on, that, that would determine if you uh, qualify for a political refugee or not. Uh, three years later, I, I ended up uh, qualifying. I mean, I got plenty of proof where I've been persecuted. I mean, how often do you get somebody escaping on a windsurfing board? How bad does it have to be that you want to escape that? And um, one reason I did it on the prison, I, I, I told you before, is that the Coast Guard actually saved and recovered my equipment. They don't usually do that. Uh, but being, I guess being windsurfing stuff, they're small enough. And they kept it on the main uh, uh, Coast Guard quarter. And they even transferred to a smaller one that is the one that actually enters into Cuba land, in, into Cuban waters, and then docks on the Maria, port of Mario. And that's where the exchange of people having. And that's where the U.S. immigration, the U.S. officer that is stationed over there in Cuba comes on board and he gives everybody his envelope of paperwork that is related to the interview that you had on board a while ago. But at the same time, that small boat had my windsurfing stuff, and they gave that to the KGB. And even then, they want to involve me in some kind of engine stalling case that they had somewhere, and we got an argument. Dude, the Americans gave you my windsurfing stuff, and I'm wearing a wetsuit. Well, how do you want me? What else do you want me to prove that I was on a windsurf? Not on any raft with a stalling engine that, that you get, and still. They, it took them a while to admit it because they wanted to fabricate something and kind of throw me down the hole in prison for, for a while, get rid of me. So were you saved from any of that because they, instead of saying that you tried to escape, they just maybe picked you up? Or did they? Did the Cubans say, oh, you were trying to escape on a windsurfing board and we're going to Well, me go trying to that. escape is out of the picture. They, it is on my file. At okay. this time, it's way into my file. They know... I'm a consistent and a stubborn escapee. And, 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 but the whole point of them not admitting that that windsurfing stuff was related to me so they can fabricate a crime. Oh, like wow. the stolen engine, whatever I engine, see. that thing. But it didn't work. So I guess at one point they quit, say, yeah, whatever, yeah, you, leave, you left on the windsurfing stuff. I never saw the windsurfing stuff. Oh, wow. Later on. No, okay. they, they, they confiscated that. They even, the Coast Guard gave me, and I love them, some kind of Hawaiian looking like flip flops. Because I only have a wetsuit, uh -huh. so they give me a, a coral and these nice flip-flops that everybody had. And once we were on the headquarters of the KGB place, uh -huh. they forced everybody to surrender those flip-flops to anything that the Americans, the Empire, gave us. They make a pyre, they light it on fire, and they made like a ceremonial. Let's burn the imperialist garbage. Really? And I was mother frigger. That's the only pair of shoes I got. I was barefoot down. You're going to have to give me something to go home. So they burn your flip-flops. You are brought back to Cuba. Were you beaten by police and attacked after they found out that you tried to escape once more? The hilarious part is that they actually did <laughs> a ceremonial turning in of me to my mom. Ma'am, he was your son. You need to know he was escaping. <laughs> like, yeah, no crap. <laughs> okay, give it back to me. Yeah, they, 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 they turned me in and uh, it started getting bad again. Uh, number one, windsurfing was done in my city. They pass it. They pass a ruling that says, oh. "We catch you in the water. Anyone here with a windsurfing board is done." Wow. So yeah, every time somebody escapes on a windsurfing, it gets bad like that for like a year. Mm -hmm. So then they soften it again. Nobody cares anymore, and somebody else escapes. Okay. And that's how it gets. And so, so what's the timeline? How long did you have to wait before that uh, application for what political refugees? Well, there's no, there's no set. Time frame. Mine just happened to be three years. Okay. But it's about, uh, at that time, it was kind of average. Uh, it, it was known that it would take that time or be denied completely. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I remember that day after the, after the interview with the American, everybody, gets, everybody that gets the interview gets back to this wearing area. And a lot of them, I was there and some people got the results right there. And a lot of them were... Uh, here, thank you for coming today. We will give you a phone call. That's a no. People oh. knew that's a no. And I was like, oh my God. And the amount of people waiting, it was getting smaller and smaller and smaller until it's only me and this guy. And I was, God. And they had a high rate of, we will give you a phone call. Uh. And then it comes to me, 
the other guy got a phone call. <laughs> got a, you will get a phone call. He left. And then he comes to me. I'm the last one. And I'm, here you go. I will have to jump again. And the guy shake my hand and said, congratulations. Here's your paper. Go and do this, the other, the other. You know, all the set of instruction, get it ready. And let us know when you need, when you, when you go for the, to get the plane ticket. To go to America? Yes. I have a picture somewhere that I took the paper, put it on my shirt, like, like a bib. And I have a big Cuban cigar and I'm halfway drunk celebrating on it <laughs> with the American flag on it. <laughs> I'm like, yes. Oh my but gosh. Yeah, after three years. Uh, I already, uh, when, while all that was going on, I have a good friend in New York City. And I kept in, in the loop of what was going on. And at that point that I got to go, I informed the Office of uh, Political Refugee because they give you the option, do you need housing assistance or are you going to provide you assistance, your housing assistance? I'm going to provide it myself. And I went, I stayed with him in New York City. That's why I spent a year and a half in New York City when I, when I first got here. <clears throat> and they flew me there straight. Well, I flew through Cancun, Mexico. This is the funny part. The Mexicans, because they fly out of Cuba, happens from Cuba to Mexico. And the Mexican knows that that entire fly is political refugee that have a guarantee. They're going to the U.S. They're going to live in the U.S. But the Mexican, tra they treat us like we were about to escape from Mexico. Like, here, here, here. Don't go anywhere. Stay here. Walk in the line. Get to that room. Don't go anywhere. Like, do you realize we we going? Yeah, we don't want to <laughs> go to Mexico. Nobody wants to stay here. Dude. Relax. <laughs> and it's mm. hilarious. But they were all this big. <laughs> you know, if you think you're going to hold me down here, you're not going to hold me. I will drag you with me. But anyway, from Mexico to Miami, Miami to New York City. And when I, that's why I ended up flying to New York City late at night. And when I look through the window, it doesn't compute in my Cuban first out of Cuba brain that at the height of where the plane was flying, I could look straight and see buildings, like right here, at the same level, and buildings and buildings and lights all the way to the horizon. That gives you a hint of the mighty of this freaking country. It, just, it is impressive. You have to put yourself in, in my shoes, especially at night. They give you all the lights. They give you a good sense of what this freaking country can get done. Yeah. I mean, had, were there night lights in Cuba at all? No, Cuba at night looks like a Christmas tree. If, if you're flying over Cuba at night, you can see the east of the island turn off, the middle turn on, the, the one on the back turn off. And, and so on. There's so many blackouts. Oh, wow. Yeah. It's, so it's, to see New York City lit up was just it's, it's impressive. To the horizon. The lights freaking disappear on the horizon. Wow. And if you, if you know a little bit of history, you know that a good percentage of those buildings were made by hand. Ribbit after ribbit by hand. Back when America used to have a back spine. There were real men in America. Wow. Okay, so what year was this that you got here? Uh, 2007. Okay. I ended up, I ended up uh, coming as a political refugee. And I like to make a point, I don't like hands out, you know, you know that for me. And I like to make a point that these nonprofit organizations, they pay for the fly, but I, I pay them back. If you had the means to pay it back, you were allowed to pay them back. So I took wow. a big cut of my check, my miserable $7.15 an hour check, and I paid them back. I don't own anybody, nothing out of my fly there. Well, and that stuck out to me too. So you were offered housing? When yeah. you got here and you rejected it, I don't know the procedure said, of it, myself. but I don't know how it works out because I, never, I didn't went that route. So because I, you wanted to do yeah, this yourself, I did it myself. Wow, that's really special. So what about? I mean, you talk about your first meal in America. Not just that. The first time I went to sleep. Oh really? What's this? It's traumatic because your brain. You go to sleep and you wake up. I wake up uh, hyperventilating because was all this a dream for it for for a fraction of a second when you wake up the first time out of that hellhole, think about it, it's like, where the hell am I? This yeah. is real. It wasn't a dream. I had a, I almost cracked here, the big smile from here. Yeah. Where'd you sleep that first night? Uh, I think I sleep on an air mattress uh, on my friend's house. And, but it's on the upper, upper west side of Manhattan. So it's kind of like a nice view. So that, I, I landed at night. So this is the first time I've seen America during the day. Oh. Immediately we went out. Like we went to Times Square. I'm like, really? I look like a dumb cricket <laughs> looking at the Jumbotron and everything. <laughs> so we went to a restaurant and we got uh, a hamburger. That's the famous hamburger story. But it's kind of sad too because we ordered hamburger and I get this massive. I'm pretty sure they first stuck it out with a with a fork. The freaking steak would move to me big. 
and I couldn't eat it all. I, I couldn't have the whole thing. So I ended up, I don't want to be that guy. I don't know what you do here. Number one, for me, there's no leftovers. We, we don't throw anything or send anything back. That in Cuba would be the three-day meal. Yeah. Uh, and he, I don't want to be that guy. So I, I, I remember watching that whole thing being sent back because I couldn't finish it. So I, technically, I was done. And that, the entire hamburger made a nut in my stomach. That was sending that amount of meal, that amount of food back. It's, that, that's, I, even today, I'm not used to that. I cannot cope with wasting food. You should see me at home. I'm, uh, I'm the guy that looks through the garbage can, to the get to the garbage bag, and see what's going to the trash. Why is this going to the trash? Why is it? I, I get on my wife's nerve a little bit, but she didn't suffer the same thing I did. She doesn't remember the '90s the way I remember. Yeah. Uh, she never had her mom. Her experience was different. Is she from Cuba? Yeah. Her family have different means, so and she was too small to remember any of that, and. Good for her. She didn't have to go through the same garbage of life that I went. Yeah. Quote unquote garbage because it's a good way to it's a hard way to learn, but it really puts your feet on the ground. Okay. And so so you're in America now. You escaped communist Cuba. You're a political refugee. And and what did you do next? Why did you join the military? No, well, right away. As soon as I had a first weekend, I went and tried. I failed the test asphalt test. I mean, our math and the math is different and the whole paragraph comprehension. It, it's a lot to do. The ASVAT test for the military is a lot of questions in, in a very short amount of time, and it's counting down. So if you time for math spire, you're done, whatever you are. Okay. So I tried just to see where I was, and I tried a couple of times I, right away. Uh, but it wasn't until, because I told you since I was a teenager, I knew one way or another I was, I was going to be on the service of the U.S. military. I don't care which one. I ended up I used to lean more to the army, but I tried it everywhere. I went to see everywhere. Even my army recruiter, when he knew all my story, he told me, "Why don't you go to the navy?" <laughs> Thinking that you will be sailing. I'm glad because in reality, you in the navy, you don't sail. But you're inside a can. You work in day at night. You don't even know if it's the sun is outside or That's not. That's what I've heard. <laughs> yeah, it's not that melancholic sailing as a sailor. That it's not like that anymore. But I got a good high uh, uh, score, so I could have picked different things. For the infantry, you don't, they don't, you don't require too many points. But I'm stubborn. And I want to I wanna see what I was made of, and I find out what I was made of, and I, I find out. That's, if you really, if you join, anyone joining the military, you want to see what you're made of, try the infantry. You're going to find out. But there's a lot of sacrifices and, a good, and a, sometimes high prices to pay in the infantry, but... For the army, if you want to advance on really high speed stuff like special operation and things, you need to be on the infantry. It's, it's, it's not given to other MOSs. The, the infantry have more opportunities to do those kind of sneaky stuff later on. Yeah. But uh, in my case, Afghanistan wasn't too nice on my body. My, my only regret is I joined, at, I think when I, when I went to basic training, I was 32. Oh, yeah. That's old for the infantry. Yeah. But I still have a really good time. Being 32, I was top physical shape. I was doing uh, 12 minutes and 43, the three miles run. Wow. I was passing young kids. It's, it's not just, I mean, in general, I was doing really good, but the infantry takes a toll. It takes a toll on your body. Yeah, and so how long were you in before you went to Afghanistan? What was that like? Uh, it didn't take too long. We got deployed right away pretty much in, like, Lapse of a year, uh, we got to to to, uh, to Afghanistan. I went there uh, May, I think, from 2012 to May of 2013, and that's where I met. Um, I don't know if viewers probably don't know, but I and two of my other uh, platoon friends, we since the whole embarrassment and disgraceful exit of the U.S. from, from Afghanistan, we've been trying to save this. Uh, one of our interpreters' life. I'm not going to say his name. I think he preferred to be called... Uh, I'm not going to say his name. He, he got a, a name for it. He, he's still stuck there. And it, it's getting bad. He already got a beating by the Taliban. They, luckily, they didn't knew who he actually was. But it's getting really close to him. And... Uh, How do you feel about that now? I mean, you were so excited even as a teenager joining. 
And now because of political... That doesn't leadership. change at all my view on the military. Okay. And once you go through it, you understand. Civilians don't know. They think we joined that to serve the president or to serve the Congress or to get oil for America. That's nobody. At the end of the day, it boils down to the guy on your right and the guy on your left. What is it that we need to do? Go take down that tree, we take down that tree. And like it or not, even this case of even of people that don't have soldiers, that don't have a really good relationship between them, one deployment through the shit and back fixes that. By the time you get out of there, this right here and this one right here are your freaking blood. And you can see how united we get after the time. And even when we get out and we are back in the regular life, that doesn't change. We, we still pull to each other. Whatever it takes, you name it, we, we are there for each other. So what are your thoughts on what happened and, I mean... That's treason. He promised those people over there that in exchange for them to take a step forward and work with us, number one, they gained the hate and the death sentence for coming forward and helping us. And these guys are not having a sweet life just being interpreted. They are out there with us. They get blown by IEDs the same way we do, and they, they, they're on the front lines the same way we do. And they did that under the promise that after everything, we were going to take care of him. I mean, forget about abandoning interpreters, Afghan. This abandoned Americans right there. No questions asked. And there's records on video of him telling many times, we, that's never going to happen. There's video of him on record saying that that's never going to happen. We're not going to abandon Americans there. Go figure. They're still there. Over 200 days already. So, so this terrible leadership that we're seeing, it's in lockstep with some other situations we're seeing across the education system in the country, the colleges. Um, there's wokeness in military training here at home. Uh, there's a lot going on, and it, it all leads to this decay of American society that we're seeing. W what are your thoughts on Tell on me going on? that that's not treason. What will happen to me if I get caught writing a check to ISIS for $1,000. What would have happened to me, to any American right now? They, they even fly, not too long ago, they're flying Apaches now. And they, they have everything that they need. And they even gained the recognition of China now. They, they're, they're, they have the recognition of the official government. What, what's going to happen? This guy, it's, there's a saying that says, there's no worse blind than the one you don't want to see. If you choose not to see the reality is in front of your eyes. There's nothing to do. You're never going to see. I mean, it's not a secret. All the, all the money laundering of the Bidens in Ukraine. It's, what can you expect? This guy's compromise. And you see it one thing after the other. Look, look the way what he did in Afghanistan. And God forbid the media just follow it. Can you imagine if Trump were done to any of that? There's actually records, video of Biden blackmailing the, the Ukrainians. You stop investigating my son or you're not gonna get the aid that we promised. It's on video. There's nothing else I can do. If, you should, if, the, if the society here chooses not to see that, what am I gonna change? With my opinion, it's, the evidence is right in front of you. Yeah, well, it's the same with socialism and young people. I mean, the Che Guevara t-shirts and... They broke with reality, Morgan. They, they, reality doesn't matter anymore. Somewhere in Oregon, they determined that mathematics are racist. Please connect those two points for me because I don't understand, I'm gonna be stupid. How do you justify that mathematics are racist? That level of disconnecting from reality these people are. This, when, when are we going to call it what it is? It's a cancer. It's cancer. It's dangerous. It needs chemotherapy. The, the, talking is not going to fix nothing anymore. We, we don't have common points to have a conversation anymore. A biological male is not a male. God forbid you, you call a biological male a male anymore. You're misogynistic, homophobic, or whatever for calling facts a fact. It's, there's no more talking. That we passed that point. The other side has, I don't know, manure on the brain. There's nothing to talk. Do you think that there's something we could do to change their minds, or at least to change the future generations to stop this nope. from happening? Because we're multiple generations nope. now deep of indoctrination. No, because these, the left is being really good at creating division. And they feed out of that. It's like a succubus. They, they need to, the population has to be divided. The whole, how about the African-Americans, the black Americans, stop calling themselves African-American. 
That's a source of division. How about you, we all call each other freaking Americans? Huh? That, that right there, you get a division on it. And you know it's really bad when Bill Maher sounds conservative. <laughs> you know things are bad when Maher, Bill Maher sounds conservative. You should see the things lately he's being putting out. And he's right. The, the, he even said, he's a liberal, and he even said that the left are going way out of whack, completely out of whack. Do you know how bad it is when Martin Luther King today, for today's standard, Martin Luther King is a conservative. Martin Luther King would never put up with abortion, number one. Nevertheless, with the division of a, the absence of a male father figure on the household. So, so look at it and how they always make an emphasis in create division in the people. So if you keep people divided and busy on something, they will never get a chance to unite. That's, it. That's how regimes like that and socialism is, is successful. You always create division. So then, with that being said, when have you heard about my communist roommate? Have I told you about her? Yes. So knowing that there's American college students with posters of Mao Zedong, Lenin, Stalin, Karl Marx, Fidel Castro on her wall, she calls herself a communist, so she's going to end poverty. Anyone with food in the refrigerator and clothes in the closet can call themselves whatever they want. That's really easy to be a communist. That's... Hypocrisy at its finest. Tell her to quit everything that she has and go to live a communist life. They won't last. Look at the hip hypocrite of Bernie Sanders. How long? I mean, we. This, this, this is why I tell you that we broke the society broke with reality. How long was Bernie Sanders pushing for equality of pay, all this crap? When they got, when he got faced with his own speech, and the people that worked for him said, "Hey, equality of pay, isn't it? How about us?" What did he do? Yes, he gave it the payment. He cut the hours. Do you see the hypocrisy on these people? They, 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 it's a great they point. They're reality. It is. Thank you so much for this interview. We really appreciate it. And my last question is, is what are your, what would you like to say to the young Americans that, that really do think, right now a majority of young Americans want socialism over capitalism. Um, there's so much that they don't learn in the education system. What is that message that you want them to hear? And then also, what is the message that you want complacent Americans of all ages that are taking what we have for granted to hear um, to try and fix this from your perspective as somebody who is a refugee from a communist country? Again, you're not going to like my answer. Uh, I'm raw, realistic about it. And I, believe, I truly believe that there's no solution now. We, we pass the point of solution. But ideally... If we get lucky enough, and enough of these millennials and young people start, quest sorry, start questioning, at least question everything that's going on or everything that they're trying to spoon fed to them, it might be a chance. Let's just say that seed of distrust of why are you feeding me this down the throat germinate. There might be a solution, but it's gonna be a long term. It takes at least one or two generations that's why I'm, I'm on the one that believes that the quick and guaranteed fix is really touching rock bottom. A lot of them are going to perish on the way. Not everybody's going to survive that. And it's going to be bad. Like, I mean, <laughs> you're going to have to be okay with eating cats. Uh, it's not a cliche. It gets that bad. But the generation coming out of that is, is a guarantee from the manufacturer that he's gonna have his eyes open. Wow. These people are not gonna learn. You know why? Because better or bad, they still have uh, the Nintendo home, they still have the iPhone, they still have the internet. Just wait until all of that is controlled by the government. All of it. So I don't think, uh, I don't think there's gonna be any good outcome. I think we passed the point. Wow. Okay, well thank you. Thank you for sharing all this, all we right. appreciate it. Thanks for coming out to Dallas. I enjoy it. I can smell the freedom as soon as I came out of a plane. <laughs> the air of Texas smells Welcome different. to Texas. <laughs> yep. Thank you, Ray. It we does. appreciate it. Thank you.
Hey guys, it's Morgan. Before we head out, I just want to say thank you for watching The Freedom Records. And thank you so much to American Journey Experience for letting us film here in Dallas, Texas at their vault. You guys, this place is filled with world and American history artifacts. It's fascinating to learn the details of the objects that are right behind us on set. So thank you to American Journey Experience for letting us film here. And actually, you guys can come here yourself. So go to the link in our bio to learn how you can do that and how you can get connected to this great place. Thank you.